Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series, The Case for Free Speech with John Stuart Mill. In this video, we're going to be looking at free speech versus political correctness. Now, political correctness is a controversial buzzword without a clear meaning. However, if even if poorly defined, it is part of the camp which claims that there is a problem with Mill's notion of free speech. It's notable that this camp includes folks that are on completely opposite ends of traditional political spectrums that have issues with free speech for widely different reasons. However, those that advocate for this amorphous notion of political correctness seem to, at the very least, fit into that camp because they're arguing for, in some way, limiting speech. In order to look at this more clearly, we're going to divide the concerns of the political correctness camp into two categories, one that we're going to call hate speech and one that we're going to call microaggressions. We're also going to divide the methods for limiting speech to government restrictions and social restrictions. And we're going to talk about Mill's opinions on both. All right? So let's take a look. Before looking about, at the arguments about these, we need to really clearly define our terms. All of these things that fit into this category are speech acts of some kind. Remember that we're taking speech pretty broadly here. Taken against a group out of power in some way which degrade or cause offense. Note that there's that important power dynamic, and you can argue about societal privilege and cultural privilege and different things of what creates that power dynamic. We're not, we're going to set those discussions aside. For now, we're just going to say that there is some power dynamic. There's one group that has power, whether that's money, privilege, what have you, and another group that doesn't have power. And the group that has power is in some way degrading or causing offense to the group that has less power. Now, of the acts that fit on that, that are speech acts, there's a wide spectrum of things that are mildly offensive to things that are extremely offensive. By hate speech, we're talking about speech acts on the more extreme side of the spectrum, such as wearing a swastika to a synagogue, calling someone a racial slur in a very derisive or insulting way, expressing the opinion that everyone of a certain national origin is a criminal and should be jailed. These are acts that might be criminalized in some liberal Western parts of the world. Western, thought of broadly in the traditional sense of Europe, North America, and Australia. Though, generally not in the United States. And that's the important distinction here. While some of these acts might be made illegal in a lot of parts of the world, very few of them, if none of them, are made illegal in the United States because the United States takes the John Stuart Mill view of free speech. Note that this does not include acts that Mill would have allowed the government to censor. In effect, things that cause direct real harm. These are direct threats. This is the incitement in front of a crowd telling an angry mob that a certain group of people is a bad kind of people. That Mill is going to say the government 100% can censor. Um, he was talking about corn dealers, so that was a less controversial issue. If there was something more controversial that someone was putting in there, he would definitely say that kind of censorship is allowed. But he's not going to say that writing in a publication or even writing a book that says that those kinds of people are bad people, he thinks that's okay. And that's where he's going to butt up against this idea of political correctness. But we'll get to that in a second. For now, just looking at hate speech, that's what we're talking about. So... The next category is microaggressions. So I'm going to define microaggressions as those things which fall on the other end of this spectrum of things that are made to a group out of power which are offensive or derisive of that group or about that group. Acts which might be offensive to some but are not criminal in most of the Western world. These include things like off-color or racist, sexist, nationalist jokes speaking to someone or about someone based on assumptions that they conform to a particularly harmful stereotype about a group, uh, saying things that represent ignorance about a particular culture, none of which might be considered illegal, though depending on the joke and how off-color it is, it might be illegal in some countries, but are still something that might degrade or offend. Note that 
All of this is a broad spectrum, and individuals may place different acts at different points on the spectrum. My point here is not to claim that we can draw a clear line between these two categories, nor to make the moral claim that one is right and one is wrong, but rather to show that there is a level of nuance between telling a joke about black people and hundreds of people marching through a black neighborhood with white KKK hoods. It's not to say that one is good, one is bad, one is acceptable, one is not. Rather, it's to say that there are degrees of difference in what we're talking about here, and it's a wide spectrum of things, and people often get frustrated with political correctness and because they feel there's an equivocation being made to someone perhaps being ignorant about a particular culture and someone wearing a swastika to a synagogue. There's a world of difference between those things, and they may fall on the same spectrum, but there may be lines we can draw in between them. As we will see, Mill is not going to draw those lines, but it's still good to have a sense of that so that we're not talking past each other in these discussions. So, I also want to make a distinction between two types of responses to these actions. The first is government action. Government is, in many ways, a form of the power of the society or the majority in democratic societies. And that is around making certain speech illegal. That's something a government can do. They can censor particular speech. The second is a societal action, often found in the form of Twitter mobs, perhaps, or cancel culture, where someone is punished by individuals for an action which may not be criminally prosecutable, but is considered distasteful by society through harassment or extraction of support. In some cases, this is not a speech act. It can be all sorts of things that you can get canceled broadly for or have a Twitter mob go after you for. But... We're going to just be looking at kind of the speech acts or the particular kind of free speech concerns here. In his work, Mill was concerned with both of these things, both the government response and the broad societal response. Saying of the coercive power to limit free speech, quote, I deny the right of the people to exercise such coercion either by themselves or by their government. That's on Liberty 21. He goes on to say, it is as noxious or more noxious when exerted in accordance with public opinion than when in opposition to it. In other words, Mill is concerned with a society quashing free speech regardless of whether it was a government or the people in the form of a Twitter mob doing it. This is importantly different from engaging with free speech, which Mill actively encouraged. And there's a subtle but very important difference, at least for Mill, between these two things. If someone says something offensive on Twitter, Mill wants you to argue with them and convince them that they are wrong, not engage in a flame war of insults or simply block them and not listen to them. Mill wants you to have that conversation and convince them that they're wrong through the use of free speech and rational argument. Because that is going to be helpful for society. Because it's going to mean that there's one less person with that bad opinion. He does not want you to just block them or insult them and further ostracize them from society, limiting society's ability to learn and grow through free speech. All right. Now, some philosophers have attempted to use Mill's framework to argue that, in fact, hate speech does cause direct harm and therefore should be limited. It's important to note that Mill, on all of these counts, says, let the hate speech happen. We need to have it as a part of society in order to engage with it, understand that it's there, and quash it in a way that will actually convince people it's wrong, as opposed to just doing it by fiat or dogma or government rule. There are philosophers, and that's what we're going to cover here, who have argued that hate speech is sufficient to be classified as a direct harm, something that Mill would have allowed us to say can be censored. So, one problematic argument for this case is that allowing offensive speech is dangerous to the speaker. If you let someone walk into a mosque and shout, death to Islam, it's likely that harm will be caused to that speaker depending on where they are in the world. However, this seems to undermine the autonomy of the speaker. Banding speech for the speaker's own good seems to seriously infringe on their rights, as much as banning clumsy people from cooking with knives would. You may help them in the long run, but you're seriously cutting down on their freedom or autonomy to do things that are probably dumb. Now, Philosopher Jeremy Waldron 
offers a more nuanced approach to trying to show that hate speech causes direct harm. Waldron claims that hate speech does in fact constitute real direct harm to communities. According to Waldron, hate speech is akin to an imminent threat to degrade and exclude individuals from a society. This does direct harm to their dignity and therefore is impermissible. Because speech can do direct harm to someone's dignity, it can be impermissible. And your dignity is, in this case, something that Waldron considers to be a real thing that can be harmed. Waldron further argues that prohibiting hate speech does not, in fact, lead to Mill's fear that we might fail to defend rights to equality or beliefs about the moral status of all humans. According to Waldron, hate speech does not lead to reaffirmation of deeply held beliefs about equality, and without it, these views would not languish and become dogma. I'm unconvinced that Waldron has met his burden of proof on both counts. The fact that speech degrades or makes someone feel unwelcome is not sufficient to demonstrate direct harm, nor is it what makes hate speech concerning. We're not worried about hate speech because it's mean to people. We're worried about it because of this kind of power dynamic or element of privilege that's there. It's not to say that there isn't some harm there. It's just to say that Waldron's reason for there being harm just seems incorrect. In the workplace, I can degrade a subordinate by telling them that their work is subpar, and that may make hurt their pride and confidence. And I can make them feel unwelcome and as if their place in the community was at risk by threatening to fire them. This does not mean that I have done them direct harm, though my speech, through my speech, and that I should have in any way been censored by the government. In fact, my advice may have saved their job, despite it in the time making them feel excluded from a community. That's not to compare this to hate speech, rather it's to say that there's an important element that this is missing that hate speech is not, which is that power dynamic, that institutional privilege of one group of people going after another group. It's not the fact that language is derisive that makes it allowable as, or, or problematic allowable for a government to censor. It's the fact that it has that, whether it's racist, whether it's sexist, whether it's nationalist tone, that people are concerned about. And so Waldron's argument here isn't the right argument that needs to be made. Even if you're sympathetic to the idea that we might want to censor hate speech, this isn't the reason that we would want to censor hate speech. Put another way, if speech that harms your dignity is able to be censored, the boy that cried, the emperor has no clothes, would be a legitimate target of censorship. His actions directly caused a deep bruise to the emperor's dignity. The issue is not that there is not some other reason to censor hate speech. Rather, the concern is that bruising someone's dignity is not the reason that we think hate speech constitutes a harm. The explanation needs to have some more to do with power and privilege than simply perceived psychological harm. And that idea of power and privilege becomes very, very difficult to exactly articulate, at least in the form that Mill presents us with, of direct, real, physical harm. Additionally, I'm concerned that when hate groups are not allowed to speak, that they are given, in fact, more power not less. Take the censorship of hate speech on online platforms. This leads to individuals with mainstream beliefs and more power existing in a bubble, believing that hate and oppression are non-existent, and therefore remedies used to quash harmful policies are no longer relevant and can be disbanded. The point is that if you completely censor hate speech, it makes the voting public and the policymakers that make policies believe that that hate and that discrimination no longer exists when in fact it may. The clear example of this is when the Supreme Court in the United States struck down part of the Voting Rights Act, which was a piece of legislation that helped a lot of black people in the South be able to vote and get around things like poll taxes and issues in many Southern states because it concluded that voting discrimination had ended. Well, there is at least some evidence to say that it hasn't. If the hate is not allowed to surface, people believe it's gone and stop fighting against it and believe we've solved racism or we've solved this issue of hate and therefore we can set it aside and move on with our lives. Whereas if you allow it to surface, it may 
be looking at the gross underbelly, but it at least allows you to say, we still have a problem that we need to fix. David Boonin, on the other hand, claims that there is no need for specific hate speech legislation since anything which we would actually want to censor can be captured in legislation prohibiting direct threats. According to Boonin, either a particular instance of hate speech is not threatening and therefore need not be prohibited, or it is in fact threatening and is covered by already existing laws against threats. According to Boonin, an elderly white woman yelling racist comments at a group of young black men is not actually a threat to them, and therefore is not the kind of speech that needs to be censored. I'm not fully convinced by Boonin either. It seems like an old white woman yelling racist epithets at a group of young black men does have the power to cause them real harm, namely by calling the cops who may shoot them or at least make them fear for their lives. So I'm not fully convinced that this analysis is going to go through either. There's also a concern around a concept called weathering. Now, broadly, there seems to be an open question of whether or not racialized comments, particularly, even at the level of microaggressions, cause real physical harm when aggregated over years. This may not be direct harm, but it's arguably real and physical, at least if you believe in this. There's a phenomenon called weathering which claims to explain the differences in black maternal mortality between new immigrants and their children. Basically, immigrants, recent immigrants from African countries have maternal mortality rates similar to those of white women in America, but their children, their immediate descendants, and other African Americans have much, much higher rates of maternal mortality, and those increase with age. The claim here is that living in a society which commits thousands of microaggressions against you leads to physical stress that can cause real harm to your body, and it particularly shows up in the process of giving birth, which is a very stressful period on the body. The longer that someone spends in a place that is racist or committing these microaggressions against you, the more stress and physical harm one's body endures. Now, while this phenomenon may explain the data, it is far from proven in any rigorous, such as an RCT, scientific way, much less a way that's satisfactory to the skeptic. But it's an interesting thing to think about. If this was something that was true, it might be something we'd be concerned about in terms of a real physical harm being done by speech. However, if weathering or something like it was proven to be true, then it might show that hate speech or even microaggressions do cause direct harm, but in aggregate. The problem remains that we do not have good methods for dealing with harm by a thousand cuts, either through government or societal remedies. Take the example of someone laughing loudly, and suddenly, someone in your office next to you has a horribly loud laugh, and they suddenly laugh whenever something strikes them as funny. And it increases your stress levels seriously, such that if it was done twice a day in the cubicle next to you for 30 years, it would lead to you having a heart attack. But it seems absurd to claim that such laughter should be censored because it's causing you little bits of harm on a daily basis. There may be tools to address these kinds of harms, but I doubt that censorship is it. If anything on this issue, I think there is a lot more room for philosophers and policymakers to discuss. I'm not convinced that anyone has shown a good, strong argument to say that government censorship is the solution to these issues and these problems, nor is societal censorship a solution to these issues and these problems, as we'll talk about in a bit. But I am concerned that they seem to be still issues, and there seem to be real physical harms that are being done. So I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments around something that maybe doesn't rise to the level of censorship, but is a different policy tool that a government could use to, perhaps through education or something like that, lead to less of this happening, though not prohibit it. Because I think that'll lead to greater harms, as we'll see. So. It's important to note that as microaggressions are, for the most part, simply a lesser kind of hate speech, if hate speech can't be censored by the government, neither can microaggressions. It's also important to note that this is not to make the claim that any such acts are moral, good, or justified. Rather, Mill's argument is that it's not the place of the government 
to censor those acts. And this is kind of what I'm talking about here of, I don't know if censorship's even gonna be the most effective way to deal with these things and that there may be better ways to do it than trying to outwardly censor it, which may deal with the eventual harms while still preserving all of the goods that come along with free speech. But I don't know. Mill would argue that society is similarly bound, punishing or silencing someone with extreme beliefs by an organization or a Twitter mob is immoral. Whether that is YouTube taking down a video that has hate speech in it or a group of people on Reddit going after someone that said an opinion they don't agree with. That's not to say that Mill would not condone fighting back. He would, he just would care about how you fight back. For Mill, the reason that you allow hate speech is so that you can expose it for the nonsense that it is and fight it with reason, not violence or obstruction. It is the difference between arguing with someone and insulting them. It's the difference between showing someone that they're wrong and never giving them the chance to learn. It's the difference between oppressing those you disagree with and persuading them. For Mill, society is made better by hate speech because it means that we have to confront our demons and remember why they are wrong. Censoring an idea legitimizes it and never gives those that hold it a chance to learn why it's wrong. Placing it in the burning light of day means that it can be critiqued and shown to be wrong. It's better to convince someone than to censor them, shut them up, and guarantee they'll continue holding that belief. Would be Mill's argument here. Now, if such actions cannot be censored by the government, what of so-called quote-unquote safe speeches? safe spaces, which is another buzzword that is poorly defined. But let's see if we can define it here and address it a little bit. They claim to censor such speech, hate speech and microaggressions, with the purpose of allowing individuals from marginalized groups the chance to feel safe. Are these things the kind of things that Mill would think are okay? Now, such things didn't exist in the time of Mill, so we're just extrapolating based on his views in On Liberty of what he would think. My best guess is that he would f might find them acceptable in some situations, but not all. When those spaces serve the purpose of debate or discussion, such as an open forum, whether that's a classroom, a town square, or on a message board, where the purpose is to discuss big ideas, Mill would likely oppose them as such bubbles can lead to the stagnation of ideas. So yes, Mill would probably oppose, especially in a classroom where you're supposed to be debating ideas, including ideas that could be offensive to people, would oppose safe spaces. However, I think there is an argument to be made that Mill would say in places where the purpose is not to change hearts and minds. The purpose is not to come to the rational conclusion, but rather the purpose is to make people happy and make people relaxed and make people feel comfortable, that these kinds of restrictions would be completely acceptable. Whether that's a therapy se session, a social group of friends that says that's not something we talk about here, or an area where the purpose is not to discuss and debate ideas, but rather just to have a leisure activity he might be more open to them as societal, but definitely not governmental restrictions. Well, I don't know. Would love to hear your thoughts on what you think Mill would think of safe spaces. Whew, that was a big one. Thank you for sticking with it. Next up, we are going to be looking at another controversial one. John Stuart Mill versus Citizens United talking about free speech versus the influence of money in politics. Watch this video and more here at Carnades.org and stay skeptical, everybody.